ಕಥಾಮೃತ ತಪ್ತ ಜೀವನ ಕವಿಬಿಡೀಡಿತ ಕಲ್ಮಶಾಪಹ ಶ್ರವಣಮಂಗಲ ಶ್ರೀಮದಾತ ಭುವಿ ಗಣಂತಿಯೇ ಭೂರಿ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಟು ಟುಡೇಸ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಗಾಸ್ಪಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಶ್ರೀರಾಮ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ಐ ಸೊ ಐ ರೀಡ್ ಅ ಪ್ಯಾಸೇಜ್ ಇನ್ ಅ ಲಿಟಲ್ ಬಿಟ್ ಬಟ್ ಐ ವಾಂಟೆಡ್ ಟು ಗಿವ್ ಅ ಲಿಟಲ್ ಬಿಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ರೌಂಡ್ ಫರ್ಸ್ಟ್ I assume that all of you have, or most of you have already studied, read the gospel, or parts of the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. But I just wanted to emphasize that this is a really singular text in the history of the world's spiritual literature, as far as I can tell. I mean, I haven't read all the literature, but I've read a lot of it. And it's really unique. And I wanted to just point to five elements, five aspects of this text that make it so unique, I think. And we can discuss afterward in the question and answer session. So first of all, This gospel is an exact, very meticulous recording of the day-to-day life of a great God-intoxicated saint, at, le- at the very least, if not an avatara, an incarnation. How he behaves, how he talks, how he walks, how he eats, how he jokes, how he instructs, how he scolds. So Arjuna, in chapter 2 of the Bhagavad Gita, he asks, Sita Pragnya Saka Bhasha Samas, how does, how does an enlightened being behave? How does he walk? How does he sit? And interestingly, Krishna, in response, he doesn't give a direct answer. He doesn't say, this is how he sits. He gives an, a kind of internal answer. He should be free from all desires in the heart, etc., etc. But this, this text, written by Mahananath Gupta, this, this wonderful text, it, you actually see how an avatara behaves minute by minute and how he interacts with others. So that's the first really unique aspect. Second, Sri Ramakrishna had a tremendous sense of humor. And the text is full of joy and humor, ananda, which makes it, it, it's, it never feels dry. Third, you not only get his spiritual instructions, you not only get his jokes and his behavior, he's often, almost every page of the gospel has recordings of his spiritual experiences. And what, there are a lot of things that are interesting about it. I mean, it's a very unique document because you can see exactly what triggers the spiritual experience. It might be that he's listening to some kind of devotional song, and it might be a particular word or a particular line of the song that triggers that spiritual experience, whatever it might be. That's also very, very unique. Fourth, fourth and fifth elements both concern his teachings. What you'll find if you study the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna carefully is that there are two different kinds of teachings. One kind of teaching is teachings about spiritual practice, about sadhana. And the second kind of teaching is philosophical teachings. And you might wonder, and I get this a lot from other monks, but also from devotees, because I'm a philosopher. I'm an academically trained philosopher. I like philosophy. I like going deeply into Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy and the philosophy of Vedanta. And a lot of people ask me, well, why don't you just focus on spiritual practice? Why bother about philosophy? But then, with regard to the gospel, we should ask a similar question. Why didn't Sri Ramakrishna just teach about sadhana? Why is, why is, the, why is every page of the, of the gospel full of philosophical teachings? And, and many subtle philosophical ideas, not very superficial stuff, but very deep philosophy. Why did he choose to teach both philosophy and spiritual practice? It's a deep question, which I think I, I want all of you to think about. I'm going to make one suggestion. which is this, that it seems to me that, well, let me uh, approach it this way. Most of you are familiar with the Buddhist Four Noble Truths. What is the fourth noble truth? Does anyone know? Eightfold. The Eightfold Path. The Noble Eightfold Path. What is the first element in this Eightfold Path? Samyak Drishti. It's the right view. And then after that, With the foundation of the right view, you can go on to practice whatever it is, samma vayama, the, the right kind of behavior, right kind of living, samma sati, the right kind of mindfulness practice. But the basis of all sadhana, of all spiritual practice, is the right view, right understanding. That's where philosophy becomes relevant. Bhikkhu Bodhi, he's a very respected senior uh, Theravada Buddhist monk. who has a PhD in philosophy from Claremont College here in California. He's written a really nice essay on the Buddhist Noble Eightfold Path. This is found on the access to insight.org website. And he explains why right view, Samyak Drishti, is at the beginning of the, eight, the Eightfold Path. And I just want to read this to you because I think it's really helpful. Right view is the forerunner of the entire path. 
the guide for all the other factors. It enables us to understand our starting point, our destination, and the successive landmarks to pass as practice advances. To attempt to engage in the practice without a foundation of right view is to risk getting lost in the futility of undirected movement. Doing so might be compared to wanting to drive someplace without consulting a roadmap or listening to the suggestions of an experienced driver. One might get into the car and start to drive, but rather than approaching closer to one's destination, one is more likely to move farther away from it. To arrive at the desired place, one has to have some idea of its general direction and of the roads leading to it. So I think this ca passage really captures nicely why Sri Ramakrishna, again and again, insisted on teaching not only about the different kinds of spiritual practices, but also the philosophical basis of these spiritual practices. What is the right way of understanding the world? What is the nature of God? What is the relation between the world and God? What is our true nature? How do we relate to God? All these different questions. He explains them in great detail in the gospel. Now, one final note before I actually get to the passage I want to look at today is a note on translation, because I've been talking all along about what I've been calling the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, but that's not the original text, as you all know. So the original text is in the Bengali language, and it's Sri Sri Ramakrishna Kothamrita, and the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna is Swami Nikhilanandaji's translation, English translation, of the original Bengali text. And I personally feel that this translation is a masterpiece. Um, usually with translations, there's a trade-off between beauty and accuracy. So a translation can be extremely beautiful, but usually at the cost of accuracy. I can think of many examples, especially of the Bhagavad Gita. There are some wonderful, wonderfully poetic renderings, translations of the Bhagavad Gita, which some of these uh, very popular translations, the translator admits, I don't know Sanskrit. <laughs> I'm not going to name names here, but there's one I'm thinking of in particular. So that's one, one, one way to go. Just make it as beautiful and poetic as possible, but at the expense of accuracy. On the other hand, there are wonderfully accurate translations of texts but which feel clunky or you know, dry and that lack that element of beauty or poetic value. And what's, what I think makes Nikolandi's translation a masterpiece is that it really is both very beautiful, very elegant English, and at the same time extremely accurate overall. So that's, uh, I wanted to say that before I point out where I disagree with him. So there are just, I mean, what I, I mean, this is a rough percentage, but I, I agree with them on maybe like 90 to 95 percent of translation choices, and I only differ respectfully on, on certain issues. But some of these issues are fairly important, and I, I hope that uh, I can bring that out today to a certain extent as well. We'll find that there are certain places where I think that there are better translations of particular <clears throat> teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. The other thing that you miss if you don't study the Kothamrita in the original Bengali is Sri Ramakrishna's genius at wordplay. He was a master at wordplay. He, I have a separate lecture on this, so you can look at it if you're interested, Sri Ramakrishna's divine wordplay. But I, basically what I talk about is how when he gives spiritual teachings, he, he uses the full resources, uh, resources of the Bengali language. For instance, he loves rhyming, and especially rhyming very short Bengali words. So some of his most famous teachings, you all know, as many fades, so many paths. But the original Bangla is Joto Mot Totopot, which is a rhyming, right? And they're all monosyllables, Joto Mot Totopot. Well, Joto and Toto are two syllables, but short syllables. Yeah, I mean, there's so many of these kinds of, you can just multiply examples. Monmuk ekkoro. Make your mind one with your heart in your speech. Sorry, make your mind one with your speech. Monmuk ekkoro. Again, everything is monosyllabic, and it really, it's a way of kind of etching the teachings into your mind. And it's full of parables also, parables, stories, just as Jesus taught very lofty spiritual teachings by, by means of parables. Um, 
anyway, I could go on, but that would be a different lecture. So I'm going to, well, I'll, I'll mention one more, one of my favorites. He says, Dhan korbe mone bone okone. You should meditate, and listen to Nikolanji's translation. To meditate, you should withdraw within yourself or retire to a secluded corner or to the forest. So there's nothing wrong with the translation, but just compare it with dhan korbe mone bone okone. Notice the, the rhyme. Mone means in the mind, so you should meditate mone in the mind, bone in the forest, kone in a corner of a room. All right, so enough prelude. So let's get to the passage. This is from, uh, you all have the handout. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to start. So this is from uh, 16th December, 1883. And I'm going to start from page 344 at the bottom of the page. In fact, another interesting thing is, in the original Bengali, there's a separate chapter heading starting with the second to last paragraph on the bottom of page 344. And here it's just continuous. It's a very long, uh, you know, continuous passage. But so I'm going to start with what's chapter 10 of the Bengali Kothamrita. Okay, so that basically it's Mr. Mukherjee and his friend left the room. So that's where I'm starting. I hope you can all see that. I'll read it and then I'll uh, comment on some aspects of it. Mr. Mukherjee and his friend left the room. M thought, he's the author of the gospel. According to the Vedanta, all is like a dream. Are all these, the ego, the universe, and the living beings, unreal then? M had studied a little of the Vedanta. He also had read the German philosophers, such as Kant and Hegel, whose writings are only a faint echo of the Vedanta. But Sri Ramakrishna did not arrive at his conclusions by reasoning, as do ordinary scholars. It was the divine mother of the universe who revealed the truth to him. These were the thoughts that passed through M's mind. A little later, Sri Ramakrishna and M were conversing on the porch west of the master's room. No one else was there. It was a late winter afternoon and the sun had not yet gone below the horizon. M, is the world unreal? Master, why should it be unreal? What you are asking is a matter for philosophical discussion. In the beginning, when a man reasons following the Vedantic method of not this, not this, he realizes that Brahman is not the living beings, not the universe, not the 24 cosmic principles. All these things become like dreams to him. Then comes the affirmation of what has been denied, and he feels that God himself has become the universe and all living beings. Suppose you are climbing to the roof by the stairs. As long as you are aware of the roof, you are also aware of the stairs. He who is aware of the high is also aware of the low. But after reaching the roof, you realize that the stairs are made of the same materials, brick, lime, and brick dust, as the roof. Further, I've given the illustration of the bale fruit. Both changeability and unchangeability belong to one and the same reality. The ego cannot be done away with. As long as I consciousness exists, living beings in the universe must also exist. After realizing God, one sees that it is he himself who has become the universe and the living beings. But one cannot realize this by mere reasoning. Shiva has two states of mind. First, the state of samadhi when he is transfixed in the great yoga. He is then atma-rama, satisfied in the self. Second, the state when he descends from samadhi and keeps a trace of ego. Then he dances about, chanting, Rama, Rama. Then M asks, did the master describe Shiva to hint at his own state of mind? It was evening. Sri Ramakrishna was meditating on the Divine Mother and chanting her holy name. The devotees also went off to solitary places and meditated on their chosen ideals. Evening worship began at the temple garden in the shrines of Kali, Radha Krishna, and Shiva. It was the second day of the dark fortnight of the moon. Soon the moon rose in the sky, bathing temples, trees, flowers, and the rippling surface of the Ganges in its light. The master was sitting on the couch and M on the floor. The conversation turned to the Vedanta, master to M. Why should the universe be unreal? 
That is a speculation of the philosophers. After realizing God, one sees that it is God himself who has become the universe and all living beings. The Divine Mother revealed to me in the Kali Temple that it was she who had become everything. She showed me that everything was full of consciousness. The image was consciousness. The altar was consciousness. The water vessels were consciousness. The door sill was consciousness. The marble floor was consciousness. All was consciousness. I found everything inside the room soaked, as it were, in bliss. Now here I have to apologize because I only give you a one-page handout. I'm going to just continue. This is not on the handout, but I'll just continue. I found everything inside the room soaked, as it were, in bliss, the bliss of Satchitananda. I saw a wicked man in front of the Kali temple, but in him also I saw the power of the Divine Mother vibrating. That was why I fed a cat with the food that was to be offered to the Divine Mother. I clearly perceived that the Divine Mother herself had become everything, even the cat. The manager of the temple garden wrote to Mothur Babu, saying that I, was, uh, that I was feeding the cat with the offering intended for the Divine Mother. But Mothur Babu had insight into the state of my mind. He wrote back to the manager, let him do whatever he likes. You must not say anything to him. After realizing God, one sees all this aright, that it is He who has become the universe, living beings, and the 24 cosmic principles. But what remains when God completely effaces the ego cannot be described in words. As Ram Prasad said in one of his songs, then alone will you know whether you are good or I am good. I get into even that state now and then. A man sees a thing in one way through reasoning, and in an altogether different way when God himself shows it to him. So for the remainder of this class, I would like us to reflect on some of Sri Ramakrishna's teachings here in this really rich and dense passage. So first of all, look at again on page 344 at the very beginning. M's first thought, according to the Vedanta, all is like a dream. What is meant by Vedanta here? Yeah, actually, that's a good point. I mean, what you said is the answer that I would, uh, that I, I agree with. But unfortunately, in the in the late nineteenth century, when people use the word Vedanta, they typically meant one particular school of Vedanta, Advaita. namely Advaita Vedanta, exactly. And, and so even Sri Ramakrishna uses the word Vedanta in the sense of Advaita Vedanta, almost throughout the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. And when M is saying, according to the Vedanta, all is like a dream, he doesn't mean according to the Upanishads. He means according to Shankara's school of Advaita Vedanta, the world is like a dream. So that's one thing to keep in mind. But in its original meaning, Vedanta means, as uh, our friend here points out, it means the Upanishads itself. Or if you want to just expand it slightly, it would mean the Prasthana Traya, which means the, the three scriptural foundations of Vedanta, the Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, and Brahma Sutra, these three texts. And if you want to talk about Vedanta in the sense of a philosophical school, then every school of Vedanta equally deserves the right to be called Vedanta. So it should not just refer to Shankara's Advaita Vedanta, but also to Ramanuja's Vishta Advaita Vedanta, and also to Madhva's Advaita Vedanta, and also to Vallabha Shuddha Advaita Vedanta, and also to Chaitanya's and his schools, Achinta Bheda Bheda Vedanta. Just to name a few of the schools of Vedanta. But this is the first thing to keep in mind. When you're reading the gospel, either in the original Bengali or in any translation, the word Vedanta is ubiquitous. But what is almost always meant by Sri Ramakrishna and by his guests or visitors is Advaita Vedanta. So that's, that's one important point to note. So M, having studied some Advaita Vedanta and knowing that it essentially teaches Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya, that this world is a dream, it's ultimately unreal. The only reality is non-dual pure consciousness. He wonders, well, is that true? Is the world really unreal? And he feels, let me ask Sri Ramakrishna, because of all the people in the world, he might be the one to answer it properly. Because he's, he wasn't just an intellectual, he was a realized soul, and he, he can speak on the basis of his own spiritual experiences. And now, so let's look at the next page here, the top of page 345. So now, Sri Ramakrishna, in response to M's question, is the world unreal, he says, why should it be unreal? 
And then this is Nikhilananda's translation of the next sentence. What you are asking is a matter for philosophical discussion. So this is the first place where I part ways with, respectfully, from Swami Nikhilananda. There are actually three places in the next two paragraphs where I want to flag place where I would differ from his, his, his translation. So let's look at this closely. What's the original Bangla? Sri Ramakrishna says, Mitta keno, Osho bicharit gotha. Osho bicharit gotha is the original Bengali, which just literally means, oh, that's, uh, that's, that's, the, that's what happens when you reason. Bichar, vichar, that, bichar is just the Bengali word for vichara in Sanskrit. So Nikhilanji says, that this means, this is his translation, what you are asking is a matter for philosophical discussion. So he takes vichara in an extremely general sense, any kind of philosophical discussion. But I think that's wrong. And I think the reason it's wrong is if you just f read the next couple sentences, you'll find that Sri Ramakrishna specifies exactly what kind of vichara, what kind of reasoning is meant. He says, in the beginning, when a man reasons following the Vedantic method of not this, not this, neti, neti, he realizes that Brahman is not the living beings, not the universe, not the 24 cosmic principles. All these things become like dreams to him. Okay? So what kind of vichara, what kind of reasoning is Sri Ramakrishna referring to? The reasoning of Advaita Vedantins practicing Jnana Yoga. Surely. So my humble suggestion is that a better translation... Of course, there are many ways of translating this, but I think roughly it would be, instead of saying what you are asking is a matter for philosophical discussion, I would translate Osha Bicharit Kota as that is the way that Advaitic Jnanis reason. That is the way that followers of Advaita Vedanta, of Shankara school, reason, using this neti neti method. Brahman is not this, Brahman is not that, denying the reality of everything except Brahman. That's the first place where I... Uh, would differ. And, and see, these translatorly choices have very, very important consequences in how we understand how Sri Ramakrishna answers M's question. This is not a minor matter, actually, as far as I can tell. Second uh, sentence I want to bring your attention to is in that same paragraph that I just read. Well, let me just f uh, finish it then, because it, so I stopped right before the, the next important sentence. So all these things become like dreams to him. Then comes the affirmation of what has been denied. And he feels that God himself has become the universe and all living beings. So I want to focus now on this phrase, then comes the affirmation of what has been denied. Now, the original Bangla here is completely different <laughs> from, from that. So Sri Ramakrishna just says, Tarpur Anulom Bilom. Tarpur Anulom Bilom. Anu, the Sanskrit would be Anuloma. After that, Anuloma Viloma. Anuloma Viloma. For an unlettered saint who wasn't educated past the age of six, this is a, a surprisingly, kind of startlingly technical, these are technical terms here used in Indian philosophical texts, Anuloma Viloma. So I think this should signal to us that he's saying something very significant and philosophically really pregnant. Anuloma Viloma. And he doesn't use it once in the gospel. He uses it a number of times, at least four times on my keyword search. And one thing that's, I think, very confusing about Nikolanji's uh, decision to translate anuloma viloma as affirmation of what has been denied is that in the three other places where the same terms come, in other places in the gospel, he translates it completely differently as evolution and involution. So why in this case does he translate it differently? So that's, I mean, I think that he would have been better off translating consistently as evolution and involution. Why do I say that? First of all, because M, the author of the gospel, in the original Bengali, he has these subheadings, which he himself wrote. And the subheadings are sometimes in Bangla, usually in Bangla, but sometimes he also throws in English words. He was, of course, highly educated, and so his English was very good. And so in, certain place, in, in a certain place, in a certain section of the gospel where Sri Ramakrishna uses that same language of Anuloma Viloma, in the subsection which M himself wrote, he translates Anuloma Viloma as evolution and involution. 
and that actually, it's, it, I've spoken to several uh, experts in Bengali whose mother tongue is Bengali, um, and th they agree with me on this, that the, the most literal translation of anuloma viloma in this particular context would be anuloma equals evolution and viloma equals involution, okay? Uh, let me read to you, for instance, this is from uh, the entry from September 19th, 1884. If you guys, there are different editions of the English translation, but this is like the uh, New York Ram Krishna Vivekananda Center edition of Nikola and translation. That's page five, uh, 544. So I'm just reading it to you. This is a, another place where he uses Anuloma Viloma, but Nikolanji translates it differently. So here, Sri Ramakrishna says, it was revealed to me further that God himself has become the universe and all its living beings and the 24 cosmic principles. It is like the process of evolution and involution. Now here there's another funny issue, which is, so the original Bangla here is, Abar dekhale tini jeeb jagat chotur bingshi tatto hoye chen, chade uthe abar shirite nama, anulom bilom. He drops an entire, the entire second sentence for some reason. <laughs> so, I mean, so that second sentence in Bangla, chade uthe abar shirite nama, means after climbing up to the roof, coming back down the stairs. The favorite staircase metaphor he uses to explain Vigyana. For some reason, Nikolanji just drops it and he jumps straight to Anulombilom. But notice here, Nikolanji says, he translates Anulombilom as, it is like the process of evolution and involution. So I think Nikolanji is correct in translating Anuloma as evolution and involution, uh, and, and Viloma as involution. I think it was a mistake for him to translate it differently here in this context. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm about to, yeah. Okay. So now, in fact, uh, before I say anything, I'll let Nikolanji explain it, because in that same passage, he has a footnote explaining Anulama, what he means by evolution, involution. And what he says is, that is to say, God himself evolves as the universe at the time of creation and names and forms are involved back into God at the time of dissolution. So the idea is that viloma, the state of involution, is when the entire universe is kind of in, the, in a seed state. In Sanskrit, the term would be bija rupa. It's like all contracted into a, into a tiny seed. And then at the time of creation, that seed expands into this entire universe of names and forms. That's the idea. But what's the philosophical significance of this? Why is it so important that we understand anuloma viloma as evolution and involution rather than as the affirmation of what, it, of what is denied. So this is where I want to uh, dwell, dwell on this for a little bit. In technical philosophical terminology in an Indian context, there's a lot of discussion among the different philosophical schools about the relationship between Brahman, the ultimate reality, and Jagat, this world. And there are two different ways that they explained how Brahman is a cause of this world. One is as nimitta karana, which means as the instrumental cause. Just as the instrumental cause of uh, a clay pot is the potter, the person who's making the, fashioning the clay into a pot, instrumental cause. Brahman is the instrumental cause of this world. In that sense, nimitta karana. But there's also a different sense of causality here. Brahman is also, according to many of the schools of Vedanta, the upadana karana of this world, the material cause of this world. The material cause of the clay pot is the clay itself. So the instrumental cause of the clay pot is the potter. The material cause of the, the same clay pot is the clay itself because it's, it's, it's made of the same stuff. It's made of the same material. That's why it's called the material cause. Now, what I'm suggesting is that if you understand what Sri Ramakrishna means by anuloma viloma properly, it strongly suggests that when he says, and he always refers to anuloma viloma in the context of explaining vigyana and specifically the realization that Brahman has become the 24 cosmic principles. And he's saying then that this world is nothing but Brahman in different forms. Brahman is not only the instrumental cause of this world, but also the material cause of this world. Everything we see is nothing but a, 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 a different manifestation of Brahman. This tallies really well, actually. Sri Ramakrishna's teachings on Anuloma Viloma tallies really well with 
the, the original Upanishads. So, for instance, there's a famous mantra in Mundak Upanishad 1.1.7. Yathor nanabi srijate grinnate cha yatha prithivyam oshades sambhavanti yatha satav purushat keshalomani tathaksharat sambhavati havishvam. But I just want to focus on the first line. It is using a number of different metaphors to explain how this world arises from Brahman. And the first line is, just as a spider spins out a web from out of itself and then withdraws the web back into itself, just so Brahman creates this world out of itself, material cause. And then at the time of dissolution, involution, as Sri Ramakrishna calls it, viloma, draws that web back into itself, which means there's nothing but Brahman. There's, nothing, there's no creation separate from Brahman. There's only Brahman manifesting in different forms. The Chandogya Upanishad, 6.1.4 and 5, uses a different, two different metaphors to explain the same idea. How is Brahman related to the world? This Upanishad in this passage says, it's like how you can fashion different pots out of the same clay, or how you can fashion different kinds of golden ornaments, like earrings and a necklace and a bracelet, out of the same gold. So again, notice that when Sri Ramakrishna is saying anuloma viloma, that he, this is, it, it goes really well with the idea that names and forms are real manifestations of Brahman. This is the thrust, it seems to me, of many of the Upanishadic metaphors of the spider and its web of gold and ornaments, clay and pots. And Sri Ramakrishna himself in other places in the gospel, he says, for instance, I once had this vision. It was as if everything was made of wax. Everything was made of wax. Wax trees, wax flowers, wax people, wax desks. Again, the same idea. It's not just that he's seeing through the names and forms to Brahman, right? Like thinking of realizing that Brahman is a substratum of everything, of all the names and forms. But seeing that the names and forms themselves are Brahman, that's the difference between Sri Ramakrishna's Vigyana Vedanta and Shankara's Advaita Vedanta. Shankara will say, yes, this world is Brahman, but just subtract the names and forms, and what's left is Brahman. Right? Sri Ramakrishna says, don't subtract anything, because the names and forms themselves are Brahman, if you see, if you see the world aright. One of Sri Ramakrishna's great disciples, Swami Turiyanandaji, he was once asked by a brother disciple, uh, Swami Sharvanandaji, who was a a great pundit of Shankara's Advaita Vedanta. So he had studied Shankara well. He's also studying, he's also reading Sri Ramakrishna's teachings and he gets confused. And so he asks, what exactly is Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy? Because it seems like he doesn't necessarily agree with Shankara's vivartavada. That's a technical term in Shankara's Advaita, which just means this world is not a real manifestation of Brahman. It's an illusory appearance of Brahman, just as if, if there's a rope on the floor and I see it as a snake, and then once I realize the truth, I realize I, I, that there was no snake there at all, right? So in the same way that the snake is just an illusory appearance of the rope, right? So in the same way, Vivartavada, according to Shankara, is, in Shankara and his school, is that this world is nothing but an illusory appearance of Brahman. So this is how, th I'm just reading one paragraph from a really, really interesting letter written originally in Bengali in response to Sharvanandi's question, what exactly is Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy? How does it relate to Shankara's Advaita Vedanta? This is what Turiyanji says. He says, God is everything in the world. Names and forms come from God and reside in God. Waves, notice the metaphors, waves, foam, bubbles. These are nothing but water. I don't care if this agrees with your Vivartavada or not. <laughs> A person who has realized this truth that Brahman is all cannot say that this world is unreal. Tini shab nam rup to tate ke ebong tate torongo fen bud bud jal chara to jol chara to kichui nai. Ete ete tomar vivottobad thaka jak ei shottyo je dekheche she ar mithya bolte pare na. So I think this is very significant. He's explaining that Look at the metaphors, waves, foams, and bubbles. Again, very much in consonance with these Upanishadic metaphors, gold and ornaments, clay, pots, Sri Ramakrishna's idea of everything being different wax formations. The emphasis here is, the whole point is, does it make sense to say that a wave is unreal? 
that it's ultimately non-existent. No, the wave is perfectly real. It's just a temporary formation. It's a real but temporary formation or manifestation of the ocean, right? Waves, foam, and bubbles. And then he specifically says, I don't care if this agrees or disagrees with, with, your, with your Vivartavada, because Sharvananda was uh, really a follower of Shankara's Advaita Vedanta. So he's clearly seeing a difference here between Sri Ramakrishna's Vigyana Vedanta, which says that the names and forms themselves are real manifestations of Brahman. And Shankara's Advaita Vedanta, which holds that this world is Brahman after you subtract the names and forms, because then what's left is Brahman, the substratum. And I'll just mention briefly uh, that on his deathbed, Swami Turiyanji, his last words essentially were, Brahma Shotto, Jagat Shotto, Shotte Pran Pratishtito. Brahma Satyam, Jagat Satyam. This is the, kind of a reversal of Shankara. Brahma Satyam, that's fine. Brahman alone is real. Jagat Satyam, this world also is real. This world is a real manifestation of God. So he's saying this from the standpoint of Sri Ramakrishna's Vigyana Vedanta. Shutte Pran Pratishtita. All life is grounded in truth. So you see how there can be different forms of Advaita philosophy. We can call Sri Ramakrishna's philosophy, Swami Vivekananda's philosophy, Swami Turiyanji's philosophy, a life-affirming philosophy because it says that life itself is also Brahman. It's not different from Brahman. This world is also not different from Brahman. But it's Advaita because there's only one reality, which is God. But that one God actually manifests as all the different individual souls, as everything in this universe, and as the personal God. Okay. So that's why, so coming back to the second place where I differ from Nikhilanji with regard to translation is this Anulam Viloma. I've already mentioned it. He says, then comes the affirmation of what has been denied. I think it would, be, it would have been better if you were more consistent in translating Anulam Viloma throughout the gospel as evolution and involution. Okay? Finally, the third place where I would respectfully differ from Nikhilanji is in the very next sentence. Well, in the same sentence, the next phrase. So he says, then comes the affirmation of what has been denied, and he feels that God himself has become the universe and all living beings. Here, this is something that, this is a translatory choice that occurs throughout the English translation. He chooses to translate God, the pronoun referring to God as he and himself throughout. Now, first of all, we should ask ourselves why. Because in the original Bangla, the pronoun is uh, ambiguous between he and she. So herself and himself. So it leaves the translator with a choice. And saying God itself just sounds crazy. So that's, we can rule that out. So then the question is, is it God herself or God himself? I believe that one of the reasons why, or perhaps the main reason why Nikhilanji chose to translate all the different pronouns, divine pronouns, God himself, and he, 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 throughout. You'll find that even in the passage I read, that comes up about five or six times. God himself, he has become. The main reason, I think, is because he was writing for a Western Christian audience in the mid-20th century. And I think he might have thought that it would have been too jarring to refer to God as she, because that's not very familiar to many Westerners. I mean, there is a kind of Mariology in the Catholic Church, there's a worship of Mary, but that's not quite the same thing. Um, and so I think that's part of the reason why he opted for this he pronoun. Now, I think it's misleading. And part of the reason I think it's misleading is because, as everyone knows, Sri Ramakrishna's Ishta Devata, his chosen deity, was none other than Kali, the Divine Mother. And of course, Nikolanji does translate divine mother in many places as divine mother. Ma, you know, Shakti. Shakti itself is feminine, right? So I think it would be truer to Sri Ramakrishna's sensibility in passages where he's referring to God, unless he specifically mentions that I'm talking about Krishna or Shiva, some male form of the deity. I think we should err on the side of translating God as she. That's my opinion. So I would, I would prefer to say, for instance, God herself has become the universe and all living beings, especially since in another place in the gospel, Sri Ramakrishna specifically explains. So in many places he says, Brahman has become the 24 cosmic principles. But in one place at least, he says, Brahman as Shakti has become the 24 cosmic principles. This is significant. Again, you might think this is a quibble, but it's not. It's important. Why? Because Brahman here is 
whenever Sri Ramakrishna, in Sri Ramakrishna's lexicon, the word Brahman refers to Nirguna Brahman. I'm not saying in the Upanishads and all that, that's a more complicated question. When Sri Ramakrishna refers to Brahman, he's thinking of Nirguna Brahman. How do I know? How do we know? Because, uh, let me uh, quote one teaching of his. He says, Jokon tini nishkriyo tokonami brummo bole koi. Jokon tini sishchiti di pole kochen tokonami shokti bole koi, kali bole koi. When I refer to that reality, as Brahman, oh, when I think of that reality as inactive, nishkriya, then I call it Brahman. When I think of that same divine reality as creating, preserving, and destroying the universe, then I call it Shakti or Kali. So now coming back to this issue of whenever he says, you know, Brahman has, the Vigyani sees that it is Brahman that has become the 24 cosmic principles. What he means is Brahman is inactive as Nirguna Brahman. So it has to be as Shakti. Brahman as Shakti has become the 24 cosmic principles. So that's even more, that's a kind of philosophical reason, well, apart from you know, whether Sri Ramakrishna's Ishta Devata was Kali or not. That's a philosophical reason why I think it's more accurate to translate, translate these phrases as God herself, as she. Because it's really Shakti that's manifesting as everything in this world. The inactive Brahman is inactive. So by definition, it can't manifest, right? OK, so now, th those are the three quibbles I have, or some, more than quibbles, maybe, with uh, aspects of Nikolangi's translation. Otherwise, I think it's quite good. Um, and now, um, going further in the passage, I want to just pull out a few more things, bring your attention to a couple more things. So for instance, so one thing you have to keep in mind here is that this is a private conversation between the author of the gospel, M, and Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna was, you know, he was God, so he knew that M's appointed task was to record everything that was being said. He noticed that M was, he didn't actually, I, I don't think that he was taking notes at the time. He had such a prodigious memory that he would go back afterward and then write down what he recalled. But he knew that M was um, at least mentally recording everything he was saying. And so one thing that's a little bit tricky about this particular passage I read out to you today is that Sri Ramakrishna himself, knowing that he's already taught M a whole bunch of teachings, he, he kind of abbreviates a lot of them and says, I've already as I've said to you before, so and so. So uh, a few of these places, like for instance, he says, um, further I've given the illustration of the bale fruit. That's it, that's what he says. That means refer to my earlier teachings about the bale fruit. So w one thing is when he's talking privately with M, he knows that M knows his teachings inside and out and that he's heard all, all of his other teachings. And so sometimes to understand what Sri Ramakrishna is saying properly, you have to do some cross-referencing. So I'm going to try to do a little bit of that work for you. So with regard, with regard to the bale fruit, I'm just taking this quotation from an entry from December 16th, 1883. Uh, well, okay, it's in the same entry. I think it's just like maybe a couple pages earlier. So he says... How can you eliminate from the reality the universe and its living beings? If you do that, it will lack its full weight. You cannot find out the total weight of the bale fruit if you eliminate the seeds and shell. So this is the bale example, that if you subtract Jiva, Jagat, and Ishvara from, from the total reality, individual souls, this universe, and the personal God, you don't get the full weight of this world. You don't get the total, you're not getting the all-encompassing reality. You're leaving something out. Which is why he's suggesting that, this is the way, in one place he describes his Advaitic philosophy as, Sri Ramakrishna would say, shab jodhya ekti in Bangla, which means it's an all-encompassing oneness. It doesn't exclude anything. Okay, so that's the bale fruit. That's one cross-reference. But there's another one. Nowhere in this passage does he talk about vigyana. I don't know if you noticed that. So when he talks about, you know, in the, in the very beginning of his answer, when he says, why should the world be unreal? In the beginning, when a man reasons following the Advaita Vedantic method of not this, not this, he realizes that Brahman is not the living beings, that he feels that the world is a dream. Then comes Anuloma Viloma. And he sees that God herself has become the universe and all living beings, right? This is what Sri Ramakrishna says. What this, what, what this stage is clearly referred to, and which he refers to in many other places, is the two stages of jnana and vigyana, right? And I'll just, so that's another very, very significant cross-reference. So um, I think a lot of you are familiar with this, but I'm going to read it anyway. 
in a different place in the gospel early on, he says, the jnani gives up his identification with worldly things, discriminating not this, not this, neti, neti. Only then can he realize Brahman. It is like reaching the roof of a house by leaving the steps behind one by one. But the vigyani, who is more intimately acquainted with Brahman, realizes something more. He realizes that the steps are made of the same materials as the roof, bricks, lime, and brick dust. That which is realized as Brahman through the eliminating process of neti neti is then found to have become the universe and all its living beings. The vigyani sees that the reality which is nirguna is also saguna. Okay, this is known as vigyana. So you can see how many of his teachings relate directly to other teachings. And so to really get a deep understanding of his teachings, you have to read the entire gospel. And no abridged edition. That's why I never recommend the abridged edition. You might think, well, wait a minute. Sri Ramakrishna repeats himself a million times. Another thing that's significant is what I find is that even if he's saying the same thing, whether it's a teaching about a chameleon to represent the harmony of religions or you know, about this, the jnani and the vigyani, there are very subtle differences in the way that he, explain, he gives these teachings. And so looking at those subtle differences is also very significant. What are the slight differences in the way that he explains the chameleon story or explains jnana and vigyana? Because it's all cumulative. You have to take everything together comprehensively to really get a deep understanding of what he's saying. So another um, example of a cross-reference here. So he says, it's a little bit uh, cryptic, I would say. So he says, suppose you're climbing to the roof by the stairs. So as, as we already know, as I just read, this roof in the stairs metaphor is a favorite one to explain the stages of jnana and vigyana. As you're climbing up the stairs, you're doing the neti neti sadhana. Brahman is not this, not that. Reaching the roof signifies the knowledge of Brahman. Full-blown spiritual realization of Brahman in nirvigalpa samadhi. You realize that your true nature is non-dual pure consciousness, and you feel that this world is a dream. And then he says the vigyan is the one who, after reaching the roof, after attaining knowledge of Brahman, realizes that the stairs are made of the same material as the roof, right? Which means, philosophically speaking, that Brahman has become everything in this world. There's nothing but Brahman. The names and forms themselves are real manifestations of Brahman. So that's what he says in the passage I just read with the staircase. But here, he adds a little nuance. So this is an example of the kind of slight differences when he tells the same story in different places. Here he says, notice in the next, suppose you are climbing to the roof by the stairs. As long as you are aware of the roof, you are also aware of the stairs. He who is aware of the high is also aware of the low. This is a slightly different teaching. And this corresponds to a different kind of teaching he gives in a number of other places regarding the two thorns. Many of you are probably experts in gospel, so you might know this. But I want, so this is another very significant cross-reference. What does he mean when he says, as long as you are aware of the roof, you are also aware of the stairs. He who is aware of the high is also aware of the low. I think the best way to understand this is in terms of another teaching he has on the two thorns. Let me read this passage from October 27th, 1885. Sri Ramakrishna says, go beyond knowledge and ignorance. Only then can you realize God. The unwavering conviction that God alone dwells in all beings is jnana. To know him intimately is vigyana, a richer knowledge. If a thorn gets into your foot, a second thorn is needed to take it out. When it is out, both thorns are thrown away. You have to procure the thorn of knowledge to remove the thorn of ignorance. Then you must set aside both knowledge and ignorance. And then he goes on to say, he who has knowledge must also have ignorance. He who is aware of light is also aware of darkness. So I think it's in this context that he's saying, he who is aware of the high is also aware of the low. As long as you are aware of the roof, you are also aware of the stairs. I mean, the idea here, I think, is, this is a subtly different point from what he's making in other places, is that, Just, so what's startling is, in the Vedantic scriptures, knowledge is supposed to be the highest attainment. And so in these places, he's saying knowledge is not the highest attainment. You should throw away knowledge as well as, so throwing away agyana, there's no problem. The first thorn, everybody wants to throw away. We want to get rid of ignorance. But who wants to throw away knowledge? This is what seems to be crazy. And he's saying, no, but you should. You first remove the thorn of ignorance with the thorn of knowledge, and then throw out both of them. 
And then what are you left with? Not shunya. It's, this isn't Buddhist, you know, void. It's vigyana, right? This is the thing. So I think this is the context he has in mind when he's talking about this. He's saying that there's an even further and greater state of spiritual realization beyond the state of Brahma jnana, beyond Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. And so long as you have just knowledge as opposed to like jnana and not vigyana, there's somehow some sense of something left out. Or there's something, you know, the, the, so because if you have a, a knowledge of light, then there's also going to be knowledge of darkness. It means you're, you're leaving something out. Sri Aurobindo, this is one of Sri Aurobindo's main criticisms of Shankara's Advaita school of Vedanta. He says that this is not the true or, 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 or all-encompassing Advaita that Vedantic scriptures teach, because you're leaving something out. You have the second entity alongside Brahman, Maya, and then this world becomes a dream. Why? Why not, why not include souls, universe, and personal God within that all-encompassing reality? This seems to be the idea. OK, so I think I'll stop there. I wanted to just, um, OK, no, I, well, let me say one more thing here. He says toward the end, this is the last sentence that gets cut off in the handout, I found everything inside the room soaked, as it were, in bliss, the bliss of Satchitananda. And again, the Bangla here is really beautiful. It's not, I mean, it's a metaphor he uses. So, Rosh in Bangla, Rasa. This is a significant word, actually. In, in the Upanishadic scriptures, it means bliss, the, the ananda of, of the divine. Raso Vaisaha is in Taittiriya Upanishad, which means that God himself or herself is Rasa. It's defined as Rasa. So it's a very significant word. But in Bangla, usually it means syrup, because Bengalis love their sweets. And uh, one of their favorites is called Rasagulla, which is soaked in a syrup. So he sees this world as soaked, steeped, soaked in Satchitananda, the divine Satchitananda. And again, I just I bring this up because notice the metaphors he uses. The wax metaphor, I'll read that to you because I keep referring to it, but let me give the exact words. This is from, taken from 25th February, 1885. He says, the bhakta also has a realization of oneness. So the context is he's, he's explaining how the jnani, of course, realizes the oneness of Brahman. Then he says, the bhakta also has a realization of oneness. The bhakta also has an advaitic realization. He sees that there's nothing but God. Instead of saying that the world is unreal like a dream, he says that God has become everything. In a wax garden, everything is wax, but in various forms. Bhaktaro ekakar gyan hoi, she dekhe isho chara ar kichwe nai. Shapno bat bale na, tabe bale tini shab hoi chen. Momer bagane shabhi mom, tabe nana rup. So notice that he's specifically emphasizing here. Why is he using the wax metaphor? Because he wants to sh highlight the fact that God actually manifests in various forms as everything in this world. This is not, the world is not just an illusory appearance of Brahman. I can fashion the same wax into a glass, into a desk, and into a laptop. But they're all real, right? And so this metaphor of this syrup, this whole world being steeped or soaked in the syrup of divine Satchitananda, I think has a similar philosophical significance. Is that everything is actually Brahman. All right, I'll stop there because I'm sure you have some questions and I'd love to hear from you now. Please, yes. Is there a mic that we can take around? Uh, do you know, Krishan? Can you help with that? It'll be better for the online audience. And please, uh, for the others here, please give your name to first. Where are you going? OK. I see setting it up, I think. Right, OK, OK, OK. Just keeping it to himself to ask all the questions. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, all right, fine, go ahead, because this is going to take us too long, probably. Go ahead, please. Um, in that Nikhilananda footnote, yeah. he says that God is a changing and evolving being, that the things that 
Mm. She manifests within, come back in her and change her somehow. Mm. But in the wax metaphor, the, the wax is, is created and melted, and that doesn't, that doesn't change. So can you speak more about God as an evolving being, and do you agree with that stance? You, well, that's an interesting... Okay, so the question is... Um, the footnote I read from Nikolanji's uh, translation of Anuloma Viloma as evolution, involution. I'll read it again, because I think that that's what the question is about. So she's asking about this footnote. Nikolanji says, that is to say, God himself evolves as the universe at the time of creation, and names and forms are involved back into God at the time of dissolution. And what she's asking is, Nikolanji seems to be suggesting that God himself or herself changes, actually changes. Um, which might be, you think that's different from uh, how Sri Ramakrishna uses the wax metaphor? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I think a little bit, right? Because, mm. because the wax doesn't, I mean, make, it, it, not, nothing happens to the wax. It's, it's the same. You're well, something does happen metaphor. to it, right? Because, because it solidifies. If it's melted wax, then it, well, when it congeals, it, it looks differently. Mm. Else yeah. will change the next iteration of what the wax will look like. Uh, One has to do with the other. It's not just a repetitive cycle. Okay, well, okay, let's go back. I mean, I think there's a, there's a deep issue here, or a question here, is about, so part of the reason why some schools of Vedanta, especially Madhva's Dvaita Vedanta, they reject Brahman as material cause of Brahman, of, of the universe. They say Brahman is, Madhvites say that Brahman is the instrumental cause, meaning that God creates this world. But God, God doesn't actually become this world in the sense of being the material cause. And part of the reason, what makes them uneasy is this, this issue that God is supposed to be perfect, you know, unchangeable, unaffected by everything. Then suddenly, how can it become the universe? If it does so, then it loses its divinity in a certain sense. And then there's a problem of evil. This world is full of evil, Right? And if God becomes the world, then God becomes implicated in that evil. And so Madhva, to avoid those consequences, he says, no, no, so God can't be the material cause, but we can just keep him the instrumental cause. But that's not the only, so there are other ways of kind of um, tackling this issue. And so I'll, just to give you one example, in another school of Vedanta called Shuddha Dvaita Vedanta, the school of Vallabha, he teaches a, an interesting doctrine. It sounds paradoxical. He says it's, Avikrita Parinamavada. Avikrita Parinamavada. Parinamavada means the doctrine of real transformation. Brahman actually transforms into this world. But he adds this interesting adjective, avikrita, which means while remaining unchanged. Avikrita. Vikrita means changed, modified. A means without any kind of change. God actually becomes everything in this world while still remaining completely unchanged. And I think Sri Ramakrishna would say something like that. I mean, I imagine that it, it's, it's, you have to distinguish, and so Ramanuja does this too. You distinguish between God's essence, or Swarupa in Sanskrit, and God's manifestations. And so in its manifestations, God is dynamic and changing. But in God's Swarupa, he remains, or she remains unaffected. I mean, that kind of, there, there are different ways of handling this. It's a good question. I don't want to give any simple uh, answers. But I do feel that w looking at Nikandi's footnote, I don't think he necessarily implies that God changes sort of irreparably or something like that. I mean, he says God himself evolves as a universe. That, I think, because that's very much a direct translation of Sri Ramakrishna's Anuloma Viloma, and where Sri Ramakrishna himself says again and again, Brahmo Chotur Bingshi Tatto Hoyechen. Hoyechen in Bangla just literally means has become. There's no way around that. So I think we should take it at face value, and I think Nikolanji is trying to do that. I think where he errs is in deciding to translate Anuloma Viloma differently in, in this particular passage. So I hope that begins to answer the question. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. you and then Brian. Thank you so much. Um, you know, there's this very robust language in, in uh, not to say Kashmir Shaivism, but these Shaiva exegesis of Kashmir. It's mm. also kind of there in the Vigyan of Haida, et cetera, of like, you know, Vishwarupata and Pashama or Unmesha and Nimesha, which seems to tally well mm. with this. Anuloma, Vinoma. But there's virtually no reference that I find in the gospel mm. to the, this kind of terminology. You know, so Which terminology? You mean the Kashmiri Shaivite yeah, terminology? Yeah, from sutras mm. like Pratya Vikya, Jaya Swadhikam, Vishwa Mun Milayati, or like popular catchphrases, Shashanira, Shivaika, Eva, these don't feature there. So was there no access in Calcutta to this stuff? 
why does Sri Ramakrishna not cite this stuff? And also, mm. does this big Vada that you're, you're mm. articulating, how does that compare to the Kashmir mm. exegesis? Okay. Yeah, so there are two questions here, both good questions. So um, one question is, there seem to be deep affinities philosophically between Sri Ramakrishna's teachings and the teachings of Kashmir Shaivism. So why doesn't Sri Ramakrishna refer to Kashmir Shaivite teachings? Because it's, it's, a, it's a much older tradition than the 19th century. So he could have. I believe, I'm not an expert in this, but I believe that it was in, only in the early 20th century that some of the key texts were actually discovered. So I think that's part of the reason. Um, I don't think that Bengali translations, for instance, were available at the time. That's my guess. Even Vivekananda, who is so well read, he never once, as far as I'm aware, refers to any Kashmir Shaivite text. He doesn't refer to Abhinavagupta. But he refers to Vallabha and to Chaitanya and so many other, you know, Acharyas. So I think that's the reason, is that it was just, it was really not well known at all at that time. Um, the second question is, what, what do I see as the similarities and differences between Kashmiri Shaivism and Sri Ramakrishna's Vigyana Vedanta? So that's a big question. It would be a separate lecture, which I might give in the future. But just to kind of summarize uh, very briefly, I'll say, I think that there are very deep similarities at the metaphysical level with regard to Sri Ramakrishna's understanding of God, as one of his favorite teachings is Brahma Shukti Abhid. Nirguna Brahman and Shakti are real and inseparable aspects of one and the same infinite divine reality. So Brahman is the st corresponds to the static aspect and Shakti to the dynamic aspect. I think this is very much, it resonates really well with Kashmir Shaivite teachings about the nature of God as Shiva, Shakti, Prakasha, Vimansha, Maya. Okay, so that's the first thing. Second, really deep affinity, I think, philosophically between Kashmir Shaivism and Vigyana Vedanta of Sri Ramakrishna is regarding this world and the relation between God and the world. Because according to Kashmir Shaivism, Sh Shiva as Shakti becomes everything in this world. And I think Sri Ramakrishna says exactly the same thing, almost in exactly the same words. Yeah. So those are a lot of the similarities. Um, regarding differences, you know, it really, we'd have to get into the nitty gritty of the philosophy of Kashmir Shaivism, but it's, ext I mean, it's, it's extremely Baroque as a philosophy. And I'm not saying that as a criticism, I'm saying it's, it's incredibly intricate. There's this whole vast system with so many different nodes, and I think there are 36 tattvas, if I'm not mistaken, 36 tattvas. But again, if you want to, well, Sri Ramakrishna refers to 24 tattvas with Chatur Bhingshi Tattva. Kashmir Shaivism is 36. So, I mean, at, 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 the, at the micro level, I bet that you're going to find all sorts of differences um, in cosmology and this, those kinds of things. But also at the level of spiritual practice, I would say that Kashmir Shaivism has very, very specific ideas about the right kinds of spiritual practice and a certain kind of gradation of higher and lower spiritual practices. Shaktipata, I think, is the highest or very close to the highest. Yeah, exactly, direct. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so I just, I don't see Sri Ramakrishna, I mean, you might be able to find some kind of parallels in some of Sri Ramakrishna's teachings, but it's not as rigid. And, and then, so this is what brings me to, I think, a really important difference between Kashmir Shaivism and Sri Ramakrishna's teachings. As far as I could tell in my uh, admittedly cursory study of Kashmir Shaivite texts, I don't find anything even approaching the liberality and broadness of Sri Ramakrishna's teachings with respect to, to paths other than his own. What I find at best is, a, is what's called in philosophy of religion, inclusivism. You find that throughout in Pratipigyanridayam and other texts where it says, our philosophy is the highest. You guys aren't totally wrong, but you guys are sort of lower stages leading up to me. Yeah, that's right. But that's exactly, that's in, uh, you know, Andrew Nicholson has a book called Unifying Hinduism where he talks about this. It's called doxography. You put your philosophy at the highest and you see every other philosophy as somehow leading up to your philosophy yeah, yeah. in different stages of lower to higher, right? So that's as far as they get in terms of liber liberality, as far as I can tell. And I think that Sri Ramakrishna would explode that and say that, no, I mean, they're equally, different religious fades are, are equally valid paths to the same goal. Yeah, does that make sense? Thanks. Uh, Brian? Please. So one thing, could you gloss the yana for us and what you really think it means and also perhaps break it down etymologically? Sure, sure, of course. No, that's not a basic question. It's an important question, yeah. And then secondly, I would be interested to hear this this It's like then comes the evolution and involution and he feels that God herself. That seems to me to be a very vital part then comes that? Well, again, that, that's also just in Nikola, just not in the original English. Yes, so I mean, Bangla. The original. No. Okay, so 
Yeah, but, well, I'll get to it. Okay, so let me just repeat for the online, for the purpose of the online audience, what the, the questions. First of all, um, he's asking, what is the etymological, etymological meaning of vijnana? Okay, so let's take that first. So, jnana. Jnana means knowledge. I think most of you know that. What does that little word v do to the word? When you add v to the beginning of it, it's called an upasarga, a prefix. It functions as an intensifier. So it's even more of that, <laughs> in a certain sense. So there are different ways of translating it. It's, a, it's an even richer knowledge, a more intimate knowledge. And then the best way to kind of really give a really accurate translation of it on an etymological basis is to look at the context. And I find again and again that what he's talking about is a more intimate acquaintance, a more intimate knowledge, richer, in some respects, more comprehensive knowledge of God. Because remember, jnana means you just are aware of your true nature as non-dual, impersonal, pure consciousness. Remember what he says about the Vigyani. The Vigyani realizes that that reality which is nidguna is also saguna. That reality which is impersonal, without attributes, is also personal and with attributes, both Brahman and Shakti. So in that sense, it's a more expansive realization of God, right? So I think V, that VI, the prefix before jnana, has all these connotations. Greater intimacy, greater richness, and a, a greater comprehensiveness. Second question, sorry, could you r remind me of what the second question? Oh, just, um, oh that, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's go back. And, and yeah. What does that really mean? I mean, okay. I know what it means what we've talked about the evol evolution and evolution, but mm -hmm. in terms of, of an actual, let's say, experience or um, what the Vigyani um, yeah, goes through or the process, I'm just curious. Okay. Yeah, no, no, you're probably... Okay, so let me just repeat for the online audience what, what you're asking. I mean, you're, you're focusing on this um, sentence, which I think was mistranslated, but where Nikolanzi says, then comes the affirmation of what has been denied, and he feels that God himself has become the universe and all living beings. And so the original Bangla is just two words, or three words. Tarpon means then. But there's no... After that, it's just tarpon anulom bilom. <laughs> That's it. So after that, anuloma viloma. Anuloma meaning evolution, viloma meaning involution. And your question is a really interesting one. The question is, in the spiritual state of vijnana, is there something, is there almost a kind of mystical dimension to this teaching? It's not, is, it, is it not just a kind of, is it not just a cosmological teaching about you know, how Brahman actually becomes this world, but is it something that, you, that the vijnani actually experiences in some sense? I think that's, that's a really nice point. I wish I were a vijnani so I could tell you for sure, but I'm not working on it. Um, but I think, that, I think that's, yeah, because there is something striking about it, just coming right in the, in the middle of this, right? I mean, onulom bilom. The Vigyan, because he's, in the context of the Vigyani's realization, in what sense does he feel, in a sense, I mean, this is also, I think, this resonates with Kashmiri Shaivism. I think one kind of spiritual experience is when you actually feel the entire universe evolving out of yourself and in, being involved back in yourself, right? Where, because you are Shiva. Right. Right, right, the panchak, yeah, exactly, right, right. So, so I, I think that, uh, I think it's um, quite right that this anuloma viloma is, is not just a philosophical teaching, but also kind of a, uh, a mystical teaching about how you, how, you, how you feel in the state of Vigyana. Uh, yes, you, you first, and then, oh, sorry? Okay, we, we, we have a little time. So let's first, let's, uh, two more here, and then we'll go online. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, I think it's funny, many stages of, mm -hmm. But I would also argue that there are so many points where he de-emphasizes philosophy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even in just these two pages, it happens in 345, he says, but one cannot realize this by mere reasoning. Yeah. And in 344, he says, but what will you gain by mere reading? And then mm. in the following paragraph, the first stage is that of the beginner. He studies and hears. Mm. Second is the stage of the struggling aspirant. He prays, meditates, and sings his name and glories. And to me, it seems here that he's almost establishing a hierarchy mm. uh, between, you know, jnana yoga is the first stage of studying and hearing, mm. and the second stage with bhakti and raja. So I just wanted to see well, that doesn't he, seem like he's emphasizing um, 
placing a special emphasis on bhaktis. Mm. Other parts as well, we talked about the Yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, so the thing is, um, yeah, your question is good. I mean, you, what you're asking is whether, uh, because in other places in the gospel, he seems to denigrate reasoning. And how do you tally that with the fact that, you know, what I'm saying, which is that philosophy is also very important as a basis for sadhana. But again, I, mean, it's, I assume you don't know Bangla. Do you, can you read? Yeah, because the thing is, reasoning can mean different things in different contexts. And so here, in this context, he's specifically referring to neti neti vichara, which is the, the reasoning specifically of Advaita Vedantans. Yeah, in other places he says, like, you know, reading scriptures alone is not going to get you God realization, right? Those kinds of which is, I think you're right about that. So, but, but, but the point is, it, so one thing to say is that doesn't mean that you shouldn't read these scriptures and it doesn't mean you shouldn't reason, right? But it means that that's not enough. It's necessary but not sufficient, maybe, we can say if you, in philosophical language. Um, and the second thing is about jnana, the relative importance or value of jnana and bhakti. Um, that's an interesting question. I mean, in some places he does seem to say that bhakti is a much even a, a greater kind of realization uh, and state than jnana. Even vijnana is a kind of bhakti state, actually, but it's a post-jnana kind of bhakti. But um, uh, I, I think most of the time, he errs on the side of saying it's, it's really a matter of preference. Some people like to eat sugar, and others like to become sugar. So the jnanis who want to become sugar, they want to realize their essence as Brahman. Others want to remain in an eternal loving relationship with the personal God. Uh, we don't have much time, so let me just, let's get one online question, then come to you. How about that? And then go back and forth. Yeah. Sri Ramakrishna would sometimes touch the head of a devotee and say, Mother, calm down. Can you please tell us about this aspect of mother? Okay. I mean, I, I, I would want to see a, an exact quotation and what text it's from. And So can you go to a different question, which is less, I mean, um, which doesn't depend on yeah. exact statements? Yeah. Ramakrishna was a staunch devotee of Divine Mother. At the same time, he used to visit Brahma Samaj regularly in, and give lectures. There. Mm -hmm. Can you throw some light on this? Okay. Well, he never gave lectures <laughs> anywhere <laughs> except in his room, which, are, if you want to call those lectures. But yeah, he never gave lectures in the Brahma Samaj meetings. He would go, certainly, and he would attend the services, and they would sometimes ask him to give lectures, but he would say no. Uh, but wait, but I didn't finish the. Uh, but I think the question is he was a follower of the Divine Mother and a great bhakta of the Divine Mother, but how, why? The fact that he attended Brahma Samaj meetings, does that mean he was also, did he, he also believed the ideology of the Brahma Samaj? And I don't think that follows. I mean, you can attend a service and not agree with all of its principles. So I think his take on Brahma Samaj is that it's absolutely a valid path to God realization, but it's a little narrow because they only accept the formless but personal God. And his view is God is not only with form but also without form. God is both personal and impersonal. Yeah. Um, Quote, mine is all this universe, or verily nothing is mine, unquote. Does not this verse solve the issue of jnana and vijnana, saying that the world is unreal as itself, Advaita, but real as God, vijnana? No. So, that's my answer. But, <laughs> so, <laughs> in spite of what Sabrapinanji might say. So, yeah, no, I mean, I just, I just think the problem is the, the entire metaphysics of Ashtavakrasamita is Ajatavada. Ajatavada means, from the ultimate standpoint, there's no creation whatsoever. That's the ultimate truth. It's also captured in a famous shloka in the Mandukya Karika of Gaudapada, who is the guru's guru of Shankaracharya. Nanirodho na chotpatti, nabaddho nichasadakaha, namukshudna vaimukta ittesha paramatata. From the ultimate standpoint, there's no creation, there's no dissolution, there's no sadaka, there's no one liberated, there's no one bound. This is the ultimate standpoint. This is what Ashtavakra revels in. How in the world do you get from that ajatavada metaphysics to everything being a real manifestation of Brahman? I just don't see it. Let's come uh, back to yeah, somebody who's alive, and then we can go back to <laughs> if we have questions online. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for the lecture, and uh, I think it was nice to hear that the Ramakrishna philosophy is based on life affirming. And in that sense, I was just, I always kind of wonder in the translation for like the Arati prayer. Uh, where it says this evil dream called life can be mm. dispelled only by that or the other. I don't remember what exactly oh. it says, but. Uh, Which arati prayer? Uh, I think uh, it's the one. Is it in the one that's in the service, yeah, yeah. the daily service? Mm -hmm. Which one would it be? I, I can't remember any evil dream in any of the songs. Kondona I mean, I. I mean, I don't mm. know if it's the English translation, that's mm. what I mean. Mm. I just kind of wanted to, like. Mm. 
hmm. understand that better. Or yeah, well, I mean, so look, I mean, what Sri Ramakrishna says is, at a certain stage in sadhana, and even at a certain stage of realization, which he calls jnana, you feel that this world is a framework of illusion. The Bangla is dhonkar dati. But then he says, when you move beyond the state of jnana to attain the state of vijnana, you see the same world not as an illusion, but as a mansion of mirth, majar kuti. So it's a transformation of outlook in a way. That's how I see it. And I don't think any of the Arati songs say anything about the world being an evil dream. Sort of. Maybe like a hoof print in the clay or something? Like that certainly, yeah. There's a, there's a standard metaphor of how, um, you know, so by the grace of God, this is in the end of the Kandana song, the first Arati song, uh, this entire ex worldly existence becomes trivial, com trivial like, like, a, like a footprint in the clay left by a cow. But the idea here is, it depends on how you understand bhava here. And it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, this world as such, so much as worldliness. All the lower propensities and worldly qualities, greed, ambition, lust, and these things. It makes all those things that we're, we've been struggling with for, for life, lifetime after lifetime seem trivial. If we can just have bhakti for God, all those things kind of sort of fall, fall by the wayside. Yeah, yeah sure. I th so we can have a few more online questions, I guess. On this. Any real human beings here that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so go ahead. More online questions. No, no more online questions. No. One okay. Uh oh. Vedanta Maharaj is unique in the sense that he is expanding Ramakrishna's teaching in an interesting way and showing how vast his teaching was. And Sri Aurobindo said 500 years would take to truly understand Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Medananda rightly trying to explore that and his attempt is appreciable. Well, that's very kind. Um, I, I didn't know that Sri actually said that uh, it would take 500 years to understand Sri Ramakrishna. So if, if that person can send me the reference, I'd be grateful. And thank you for the compliment. All right. Thank you so much. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Sri Ramakrishna Rupanamastu